join together, hungry for justice and hope, waiting to be nourished by the food that you offer us. As you care for the land that feeds the world, tend to our bodies and spirits that we may be nourished by your presence. God of God, give us this day our daily bread. The rich crops that you have prepared are now ready to be harvested by our hands and our hearts. Please remain as you are. You may be seated. Well, we are just delighted to see you in worship with us today. If you are here in the congregation, if you are here for the first time, we really want to say welcome to you. Would you just wave at us if you're new so we know that you're new? We have several people. Would you just give them a hand and say welcome? We're glad that you're here, and we hope that you'll enjoy worship and that you will, if you don't have a church home, well, now you do. We're just glad you're here. And if you're joining us online, we're delighted that you're here with us as well. We want to say always welcome. We're glad for our online visitors. We, you look around sometimes these days, and in churches, in the actual buildings, you don't see as many people, right? Now, those of you that grew up in church. But if you look at how many are checking in online, it's amazing how many people are up with us this morning at this very moment all around the world and we want to say welcome, and we're glad that you're here and joining us as well, and we want to make it as wonderful for you as we can. You will miss this part, though. We're going to pass the peace to one another. 
Would you rise as you're able and pass the peace, welcoming each other to God's house this morning? be seated. The first reading is from the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, the message version. My response is to get down on my knees before the Creator, this magnificent Creator who parcels out all heaven and earth. I ask God to strengthen you by spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite Christ in. I ask that with both feet firmly planted on love, you'll be able to take in with all the followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its lengths. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives full in the fullness of God. God can do anything. You know more far than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. God does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, the spirit deeply, gently within us. Glory to God in the church. Glory to God in the Messiah, in Jesus. Glory down all the generations. Glory through all millennia, oh yes. Please rise as you were able. remain standing for our second reading, which is taken from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, the message version. After this, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee, some call it Tiberias. A huge crowd followed him, attracted by the miracles they had seen him do among the sick. When he got to the other side, he climbed on a hill and sat down, surrounded by his disciples. It was nearly time for the, pas the feast of Passover, kept annually by the Jews. When Jesus looked out and saw the large crowd had arrived, he said to Philip, where can we buy bread to feed these people? He said this to stretch Philip's faith. He already knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, 200 silver pieces wouldn't be enough to buy bread for each person to get a piece. One of the disciples, it was Andrew, Brother to Simon Peter said, there's a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but that's a drop in the bucket for a crowd like this. Jesus said, make the people sit down. 
and there was a nice carpet of green grass in this place. They sat down, about 5,000 of them. Then Jesus took the bread and, have giving thanks, gave it to those who were seated. He did the same with the fish. All ate as much as they wanted. When the people had eaten their fill, he said to his disciples, gather the leftovers so nothing is wasted. They went to work and filled 12 large baskets with leftovers from the five barley loaves. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God. Amen. be seated. Now, I don't know if you were like me, I did grow up in church. I grew up in Sunday school, and I remember as a child, now, uh, you know, I've said this before, those of you that have been around, we had flannel board. Some of you know what that is. We had these flannel board with these little paper characters that you would put up with the, with the Jesus stories, and especially these, like this story, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And then as you grow older, you begin to wonder, was it really 5,000 people? And you find out and study that they probably only recorded the males, and so there were probably women and children, and so who knows, 15, 20,000 people following Jesus around. But even at 5,000, I don't know about you, but that just seems a little insurmountable. Now, this is a great Sunday school story. It's of the, of the miracles of Jesus. This is the one that is recorded in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all recorded this particular story. It, a lot of the, the stories that we have are only recorded by one or two of the Gospels, but this one is recorded by four. So you have to look at it and say, well, wait a minute, if this one was important enough for all four to record, maybe I better look at it again. So we look at it again, and we see that, well, let me just be honest with you. When I was a child, I had no problem thinking about the miracles of Jesus. I grew up in Pentecost. I had seen people healed instantaneously. I had seen people at the brink of death come back, and I had seen all sorts of things happen that we would call miracles. That was not so uncommon in the way that I grew up. There was a lot of the power of the Holy Spirit around us, I will tell you. And I don't know why some days miracles happened and other days they didn't. I don't think it was a faith issue because it was the same people with the same kind of faith day after day. I don't understand the ways of God sometimes, but I just know that sometimes it works. So it doesn't hurt to ask, right? So we have in this story Jesus and the disciples. They've been at rest. They've gone away to be alone, to get refreshed. I preached about that last Sunday. I hope you've spent your seven minutes with God a day. I hope that it turned into a lot more than seven minutes. It did with me. Several mornings, it was two hours later, and I was still praying and studying and pulling in stuff to just refresh my own spirit before I got my day started. Jesus had to be ready to face those around him. Jesus knew what was coming. You see, we have to get ourselves rested up so we can go minister to others. Now, we'll give you a little secret having been used in the Holy Spirit at times to do things. When the Spirit uses you, 
it will really energize you. It will give you so much energy, you don't know what in the world. It's like supernatural. Well, it's not like. It is supernatural energy that causes you to be able to go and do things you never thought you could do. But I want to tell you on the human side of that, when, it, when the Spirit kind of lets up and you're finished with what God has told you to do on that moment, you're usually just like, oh, exhausted. And that is a good exhaustion. I don't mean a bad exhaustion. I mean a good exhaustion. Because you go knowing that your heart and your spirit are right and that everything has been done for God. These people are following and waiting for their miracles and listening to Jesus' teaching for hours and hours. Their seven minutes grew that day too, you see. And at some point, they're past lunchtime and Jesus, knowing what he was about to do, turns to his own disciples, the ones he's been teaching to carry on when he's gone. You know, that's us. Think. And he turns to Philip, one of them, and says, well, it's lunchtime, and I know these people are hungry. We need to feed them. So Philip, being the good disciple that he is, goes around to the other disciples and says, well, Jesus says we need to try to figure out a way to feed these people, how much money we all got, how much money's in our little treasury, and how much you got, and how much you got, and how much, what can you donate, what can you donate? Don't we do the same thing when we know somebody's in need? Sure. Here's the problem. They came up with a handful of money, but it was not enough people to probably feed 40 of them, much less 5,000 plus people. Can you imagine trying to feed five? Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, and, and, and I'm not complaining about my salary at all. I'm just going to say, I'm not sure that this week I could feed 5,000 people uh, if you just came up to me and wanted the money in my pocket. or my, I, I'm not sure that that could happen. In fact, I'm quite sure it couldn't happen. 5,000 people, how are we going to feed these people? And Philip says, I don't, Jesus, we can't do it. We, we don't have enough money to feed all of these people. See, if this was a test for Philip, he failed. Not in the faith department. Oh, I, don't, don't worry. He's a good person of faith. He's still Jesus' disciple. But he failed to realize who he was dealing with. You see, sometimes we forget who we're dealing with. We forget who's dealing with us. Come on now. And if God asks us to do something, it may seem totally impossible for us to do. And we may react, and I'm, I'm guilty. I've, I've had God speak to me, and I knew it was the Holy Spirit, and say, I need for you to do this. And I just said, well, I don't know how we're going to do that. And it, and it wasn't that I'm not a person of faith, and it's not, I've told you I've seen all sorts of crazy things in my life that had to be supernatural, had to be supernatural. And yet, I'm just as human as Philip was. I forget sometimes who is asking me to do it. And that if God is asking me to do it, then God must have a way already figured out. But it's probably because of this story. And see, Philip had not had the benefit of reading this story that I've had. So he goes and gets the other disciples and they pull their money together and, and, and they say, well, Jesus, this is what we have. What do you want us to do? But at least one of them said, but we have got a child that has five loaves and two fish. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm always amused at that part of the story. Because I don't know exactly, I mean, were they like running around saying, well, we got all this stuff. Well, I'm not going in there to tell Jesus that I, we don't have anything but this amount of money, but let's push this kid up there to be sure he won't embarrass us in front of this child. Who knows what was going on in their minds and the reason that they found this child that had something. But I believe it's because that child was willing to share what he had that that's the reason he was the one that came up you see Jesus wasn't even angry at Philip he wasn't angry at the other disciples 
he was ready to teach them their next lesson, the lesson for us to get even today. He wasn't interested in what they already had. He was interested in what they didn't have, but were ready to find and find a way that these, what little they had, could become much. Well, you know, you know the story. You just heard the reader. We have this story where Jesus tells them, well, go set everybody down, get them all settled. Jesus says, let's get organized. Uh-oh, there's a, there's a point. <laughs> let's get everybody organized, first of all. Get everybody in line and lined up. Let's get it all. Jesus had a plan, you see. Jesus didn't do it willy-nilly. A lot of times we feel like we have to do it on the spot. But Jesus made a plan and worked through the process. And then Jesus did ask the little boy, and the little boy gives him the five loaves and two fish. And somehow or another, according to just a little bit of information that we have from that story in all four readings, all we know is that Jesus started breaking the bread and the fish up and giving it to the disciples, and they started feeding people. And everybody, according to the story, everybody there got fed. Everybody. On top of that, everybody got full. They didn't just get a nibble. They ate enough to be full. Think about that. And then, if that wasn't enough, they ended up with 12 baskets full of food left over. Now, as a child, I will go ahead and tell you that I saw Jesus just breaking that up and it just kept breaking and it just kept multiplying in his hand. But as an adult, I look at that in, re in the real world and say, did this really happen? Did it really happen that way? What was the real miracle? And it occurred to me that may be because they had 12 other baskets. Where did those 12 baskets come from? Somebody had to bring 12 baskets. Did they walk around with empty baskets? Or maybe, just maybe, one explanation could be that there were a lot of other people that had a lot of food that they could have shared with each other, but maybe they were holding on to their baskets. Come on now. They were holding on to their baskets, and the only one, the only one in the crowd that was willing to share was a little boy who says, well, I have this. Will this help? And was willing to share what he had. And then once he shared, and Jesus divided that up, other people said, well, here, I, I have something too. And, and I brought more than my family. Can't, you, you ever go on a picnic with your family? I don't know about you, but um, in our family, even though we weren't wealthy people, if we brought food, we didn't just bring enough for us. We always brought enough to share with other people. And maybe, just maybe, the miracle was organizing all of those people and them watch. Now, let, let's see how this really works. Let me give you a modern-day example and see. Because I ran across this story in Guidepost a while back. And there's a story of Mother Teresa. You've heard of her? Mother Teresa, now this is some years ago, mind you, but it had, it had really spoken to this minister that was writing about it in Guidepost. And he said, they were on a plane, Mother Teresa was on a plane, you know, Mother Teresa was the person who went out preaching for the poor, reaching for the poor, fighting for the poor, trying to feed everybody, trying to get everybody out of poverty and minister to those in need. Mother Teresa is on a plane going, I believe, to Mexico. And while she's on the plane, they come back and offer food. 
Now, remember, we used to didn't have to pay for the food on the plane. We paid for it in our tickets, right? Now you have to buy it on the plane or you buy it in the, in the shopping mall that is our airports these days. And so Mother Teresa, when they bring her the food, she stops them and asks the attendant, can you tell me how much that plate costs? that you're offering me, and they said a dollar, so you know it was a long time ago, right? <laughs> it was a dollar. And she said, would you keep the food and give me the dollar so that I can give it to the poor when I land in Mexico? And so the person went up and asked, asked whoever was over them, they radioed in, and they came back and said, yes, I'll give you the dollar. Well, when that happened, the person beside of her was like, well, can you do that for me? That I, I'm willing to give up my meal. And people started hearing what was going on, and before it was over, everybody on the plane had refused their food and taken the dollar and given it to her so that when she landed, she would have money to go feed the poor. Now, that's how little becomes much because one person was well and ready to make it happen. Oh, but you see, that ain't, that ain't the end of the story. You see, that's only part of the story. Because then Mother Teresa goes at near the end of the flight, she says, what y'all gonna do with all that food? Because <laughs> you've done warmed it up for all of us and, and, and you can't warm it again and you can't put it back, so what are you gonna do with all of that food? She said, I'd like to have that food to take to the poor with the money that I have to buy them some more. And so they went and talked and radioed in, and sure enough, they really couldn't reserve it, so they gave her the food. But now, you know, she didn't, Mother Teresa didn't, didn't have just a little rental car waiting for her when they got there, so she turned to the person beside her and she said, well, I need a truck to put all of that food on. So they radioed ahead and called ahead and somebody heard what they were doing and got her a rental truck ready and waiting when she got there and the truck was so big and she drove it, by the way. She drove it full of the food and they said she was so short that her feet would hardly reach the pedals and she had to look through the steering, steering wheel to see. But she delivered all of that food and the money to a poor section of town into a cardboard section of town, a cardboard village. If you've been to places like that, you know what I'm talking about. I've seen them myself. That said to me how that story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 could happen. That's how that can happen because one person is willing to share one person is willing to step out in faith. You say, well, I, I'm not sure I can be that bold and brazen. I'm not sure how in the world that would happen. And I'm not so sure that happens all the time. But God doesn't expect the same thing to happen over and over. God gives us new and creative ways for that to happen. I can tell you another story. Let me give you another example of how little becomes much. There was a nun who had to give up all of her worldly goods. Well, she had some cash, like $500 worth of cash. And when she gave that up, she went and bought $500 worth of stock in Coca-Cola and then just willed it to someone for the church when she died. And she lived to be an old, old woman. And when she died, they found this note this, that she had stocked and they had left it to the church and it had grown to five million dollars over the course of her lifetime. Little became much because she heard and she left a legacy you see. She left a legacy behind her. She heard the voice of God when God multiplied. I'll tell you an even more simple story. That's not so grand. I know a preacher man in Tennessee 
he did not know much about uh, plumbing, but their water supply ran out at his house. And one day he decided they didn't have the money to get it fixed. They didn't have the money to call a plumber. They were not wealthy people. So he got out there in the front yard. He figured out that the problem must be in the water line running into the house because they couldn't find anything in the house or under the house, so it had to be running in. So he went outside with his shovel and started digging up the front yard. And he's out there with a hole, and his wife came out there. I, I know this man. This really happened. I'm not making this up. This is not some story out of a book. He's digging up his yard not knowing what he's doing nor any clue how to fix it once he finds the problem. And his wife came out there and asked him, what are you doing digging up the front yard? You don't know anything about plumbing. You don't know what you're going to find, and you don't know how to fix it. He said, yes, but if I start, somebody will come along here and tell me what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> and they'll tell me how to fix it. That really happened. I remember when he told it in church, I was like, wow. And he said, you know, I kept digging, and sure enough, some of my neighbors started coming out to see what was going on. And sure enough, one of them knew what to tell me to do to it, and he was able to fix the problem himself that did not cost him a whole lot of money because he was willing to take a moment, take a little bit of his time and go out and start the process. Little can become much if God is in it. Little can become much. Our little bit. You say, well, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty rough. Well, I'm working on something, too, and I'll ask you because I figure somebody online and somebody in this place knows we have a minister in our denomination who sent out an email last night, and I won't tell you his name because I won't embarrass him at this point. At this point. Well, I don't want to ever embarrass him, but I don't want you, you know what I mean. And he's not had a church in a while. He's not been the pastor of a church for a while. And he's been driving for Lyft. And he's seen his income getting lower and lower and lower and to the point of his car being repossessed yesterday. So now he doesn't even have a source of income. Doesn't have a place to live. One of our pastors. And here I am working on my sermon about Jesus feeding the 5,000. He's in Clearwater, Florida. And I saw a bunch of, he put it on our clergy link on our, in our denomination on Facebook, and, and I saw it, and, and, and all, these, all of these other ministers started reaching out and started sending money. I mean, there was a fund set up immediately. And I was like, man, you should have told us this before your car got possessed. You probably would have enough money to keep your car. Maybe he can get it back. I'm praying he can get it back by the money that's coming in. So he didn't have to sleep on the street last night or in a shelter last night. Not that he's too proud to do it because he was willing to do it. And he didn't want to ask for help. And how many times are we guilty of the same thing? And I will tell you, that doesn't mean everybody can run to our rescue every time. I know that that doesn't always happen. And sometimes, well, I should say most of the time for me anyway, it's my own poor choices that gets me into a pickle sometimes. But thank God people have looked after me. God has looked after me. And their little became much because they prayed over it and they knew what to do. But I sent him a private note because I was working on my notes all over again last night. They, they, they disappeared into the Ethernet somewhere. I do not know where. So I had to recreate all of this last night in the, you know, till 2 o'clock this morning. But I, if I hadn't, if I wouldn't have seen that post because I wouldn't have been online. And I wrote him a private note and said, okay, I don't know the answer to this just yet, but I know that there's some housing. I need to know how old you are. I need to know if you have any disabilities, other abilities, because there may be help right here in this town, and we can get you from there to here, but we, I need to know a few details so I can find out if we've got some help around here for you. I said, I even know that there's some some elderly gay and lesbian housing somewhere around here that's based on your income. And, and I, I said, he said, well, I've never, I got a note from him when I was on my way to church this morning. I, I, I checked back in. I saw I had a note from him. And he said, I didn't even know such things existed. 
And I kept saying, Lord, let our little become a whole lot. That's a person that we love, a person that's given his life for ministry, and now he's in need. What are we going to do? We need to start thinking, yeah, we can all send him a little offering, and I get that, and I'm not saying don't send him an offering. We need to do that. However, however, that's only going to last for a few days, you see. We got to look beyond that. We got to look at, at feeding the whole 5,000 until they're full. Come on now. Till they're full and there's some left over for other people when we don't even realize it. Oh, I'm telling you, little is God, a little as much if God is in it. You, why am I telling you these stories? Why am I telling you about how some real life stuff has happened in my lifetime? I'm telling you that to build your faith to build your faith about what you're going through. What you need. How hungry you are. You heard the call to worship. You heard the words of the songs we sang. It's not just there out of coincidence. It's there for us to receive what we need to build our faith in what God can do with and for us. It's to plant a seed in front of you that there is no problem too big for our God. You need to remember that. Somebody need to hear that. There is no problem too big for our God. And it's to let you know that we are co-creators with God. We are co-actors with God. We are co-rescuers with God. God we are co-feeders with God see it's good to sit around and pray about it absolutely we need people praying about it don't stop praying about it we want to pray about it but don't just pray for the instant momentary answer pray for the wisdom to know how to fix the long term problem It's to remind us that we are all called to ministry. Every single one of us in this room. You say, well, I'm the one sitting here in need. No, God's called you to ministry. God's called you to minister to somebody else. I remember, I remember a time in my own life when I had no money but like $3 in my pocket and did not know how I was going to eat. I did not know how I was going to make it. And the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, give that $3 to so-and-so. I was like, God, you know I don't have anything. And God said, give that $3 to so-and-so. And I'm not telling you to do that on your own. I'm saying the Spirit actually spoke to me and told me to do it. And I had a choice. I had a choice. And after service, I walked up with that $3 bundled up, folded up in my hand, and gave it to that person. And don't you know, Somehow or another, money came in from somewhere. Groceries came in from somewhere that week. I don't even remember how it all happened. All I know is there was more than I needed. I was full all week, and there was food left over. I do remember that. I will also tell you that we are called to ministry, and we're the ones called to perform these modern miracles. And this story, would not even be in our scriptures today if it wasn't for one little boy. One little boy who was willing to share his lunch. And how many of us through 2,000 years have been fed on that story alone? I like what the Apostle Paul wrote. I'm going to read it to you again. He's another one that knew how to co-act and co-operate with God to get things done. And he may have said this to the Ephesian church, but I believe we in the modern church need to hear it. He says, my response is to get down on my knees before the creator, this mag magnificent creator who parcels out all heaven and earth. I ask God to strengthen you by the Spirit not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength. That Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite Christ in. And I ask that with both feet planted firmly on love, 
you'll be able to take in with all followers of Jesus the extravagant dimension of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. God can do anything, you know. Far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. God does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. The Spirit deeply and gently within us. I'll leave you with that thought today. Look at those around you. How can you be a blessing? How can we be a blessing? How do we continue to feed the 5,000 today and make them not only for the moment, but how do we make them full? How do we make them full with food left over? I'm not just talking about physical food. I'm talking about spiritual food. And are we listening when we are called to be the modern miracle workers today. Hear the voice of God. Amen.
Good morning, ordinary people. Ordinary people are capable of doing extraordinary things. And here at Founders, we've got extraordinary things galore. They just come flying off the sheet, if I could read it. Um, we've got um, downtown LA, downtown LA crowd. We will be sponsoring a, um, we, will put, we will be participating. And I am going to invite you to come down. We don't have a date here, but do you know the date? It's at the end of August. Sorry about that. Um, the tw Saturday and Sunday, the last Saturday and Sunday in August. Please come down, join downtown LA Pride. Proud. Also, um, we have to tell you that we are having a memorial service for our Usher Emeritus. Glenn Payne on August 18th here in the sanctuary at 11 a.m. Please try to come out and honor a man that has given this church and this denomination and this community so much. One thing you can't miss, and that's next Saturday, our own Patrice Ford is in concert. She's giving a concert to collect donations because she's going off to Washington State University at Seattle. Yes, that one. <laughs> she's going off to school. So therefore, we're gonna give her a grand send off and I hope you come out and hear her sing from the heart sing from the soul, sing to give back to God. So please, come out next, this coming Saturday at 6.30. Also, the VVT is sponsoring a movie, Rocky Horror Picture Show. All y'all have been in the Rocky Horror Picture Show once in your life. So come out August 18th at 6.30 p.m. downstairs in the theater. We have a great, great event coming up. That is the 50th anniversary of the founding of this church. Our committee for that uh, event is meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. And anyone who would like to join us, please join us. But please, please, please save the date. October 5th, 6th, and 7th right here. Ordinary people do extraordinary things. Would the ushers come forward? Because we're going to do extraordinary things with the offering. Please give as you would give to God.
and in doing so, the love that we share through these gifts may bless those who seek to know you more intimately. Therefore, with a grateful heart, we say, Amen. May God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is good, right, and a joyful thing to give you thanks, most holy and gracious God, for you are doing a new thing, making a way out of no way, with rivers of life-giving water flowing through our desert places, bringing beauty everywhere. Our God who is doing a new thing, who created us, redeemed us, calls us by name, who is with us through flood and fire, so we have no reason to fear. Our God, who is doing a new thing, we thank you for your spirit, who transforms us to become more and more who you have created and called us to be. Our God, who is doing a new thing, we are here to listen to you and to one another in your world and discern what that might be what and where new life is springing up and how we might find our way there, each of us individually and all of us communally. We ask now for the help to experience you in new and different ways in people and customs, even those that are uncomfortable for us. We ask now for the help to ensure what we are doing is discerning spiritually together and not just deciding strategically what seems to be best at the moment. We ask for help to empower us to move forward in new life with you, expressing gratitude for your goodness, being both faithful and fruitful in wherever it is you call us. Oh God, lead us and guide us throughout our journeys in a mighty and powerful way. Holy Spirit, grant us wisdom, discernment, and clarity of mind and purpose as we follow the footsteps of Jesus to lead with both compassion and boldness, that we may live out the mission to which you have called us. And we know you are listening to both our spoken prayers and those that are whispered on our hearts. Therefore, we also pray for our church, our denomination, for J. Michael Johnson as he recovers from heart surgery, for Laura Laws, continued health, for Reverend Gina Chapman, a pastor of the MCC Good Samaritan, who is in delicate health. We also take a moment of silence to give you thanks, O oh God, for blessing, blessings received and to pray for those in need and those who seek your healing. For these and all the prayers that are on our hearts, both spoken and unspoken, we pray to God as we sing together a prayer in the spirit, the way Jesus taught us to pray.
Today, we remember Jesus Christ, who invited all who were thirsty to come and drink, all who were hungry to come and eat, who earnestly prayed for all of us, even in the face of betrayal and crucifixion, and who calls us today to break bread together, to love one another, and to include all those who desire to share in this, this great table of fellowship. We remember that on that night, you took the bread, you lifted it to the heavens, blessed it, broke it, and shared it with each who were there and said, take and eat. And each time you do this, do so in remembrance of me. In a likewise manner, he took the cup, lifted it, blessed it, and again shared it with each at the table, saying, take and drink, each of you. Let this be like my life's essence poured out for you. This is my covenant with you. God of all power, just as the spirit of life embodied Jesus in the tomb, so now breathe your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine, that they may be for us the life of Christ. May we be empowered to make that life visible through our actions and our love in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At Founders MCC, and at, as at all MCs through, MCCs throughout the world, we share an open communion. That means that everyone is welcome. You need not be a member of this church or any church. And no matter what rules you may have been told, they don't apply here. Because this is not our table. This is God's table, and all are welcome. Would the ushers, acolytes, and servers please come forward?
We are delighted that you came to worship here today. You remember that whatever God lays on your heart to do, no matter how small it seems, can mean a whole lot to a lot of people. If you don't, if you don't believe me, go out that door on the side instead of the front and look at those steps. And you'll see what two of our angels this week, Mr. Martin and Miss Jenny, did to make our steps all pretty and painted and power washed and all of that so that all of us can enjoy. Two people took a few hours out of their time and gave to God for us to benefit. Little is much when God's in it. Would you rise as you're able and join us in our closing song? Sorry about that. I thought it was time to do the closing song, but for those of you who don't know this, I'm sure many of you do know this, this past Friday was our founder's birthday, Reverend Troy Perry. We were hoping he would be here this morning. He's here when he is able to be here, and um, we ask you to pray, keep him in prayer too for his health. But when um, we want to celebrate his birthday, there's cake. That was coming, it was coming. It uh, you know, looked like it's on fire back there. Uh, <laughs> so maybe we, we may. <laughs> we were going to sing happy birthday in case because Troy looks at us online. And we want to say happy birthday to our founder and, uh, and member of this church, Reverend Troy Perry. Lead us, James. Happy birthday, Troy. We love you. Now we'll have our closing song.
pray with me. Precious God, thank you for your power and your presence in this place. Thank you that among us, so many ideas, so many creative ideas are just waiting for us to act. Thank you that we are co-creators, that we are so co-actors in this thing called life, that there is nothing too difficult for you, and that sometimes we limit ourselves on what we can do because we think it is so little but we fail to remember that our little becomes much when you are in it. Let us hear your voice, let us act on your voice, and let us bless everyone we come in contact with this week. We ask in the name of Jesus our Christ and all that is holy. Amen. Now shake hands and be friendly.